The Internet History Podcast is brought to you by MetaLab. Their slogan is MetaLab, we make interfaces. For a decade, MetaLab has helped some of the world's top companies and entrepreneurs build products that millions of people use every day. You probably didn't realize it at the time, but the odds are you've used an app that they've helped design or build. Apps like Slack, Coinbase, Facebook Messenger, Oculus, Lonely Planet, and many more. MetaLab wants to bring their unique design philosophy to your project. Let them take your brainstorm and turn it into the next billion-dollar app, from idea sketched on the back of a napkin to a final shipped product. Check them out at metalab.co. That's metalab.co. Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. So this one is a longtime dream coming true. Roseanne Sino has been on my list to talk to from literally day one of this podcast. As you know, I started out by reaching out to Netscape folks, and Roseanne was the head of communications for that very first dot-com company. So she saw it all, and she can give us her take on both the engineering side and the management side, since she was uniquely able to observe both. Roseanne and I were recently on a documentary series currently airing on A&E in the U.S. called The Untold Story of the 90s. So I reached out and finally we were able to connect and we recorded this fantastic extended interview about all things Netscape and about the very birth of the Internet era. Please enjoy this conversation with Roseanne Sino. Roseanne Sino, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Happy to be here with you, Brian. Uh, so you're uh, an actual Bay Area native, is that right? It is true. My parents were um, are Italian immigrants, but um, I was born here, and I just managed to move around the Bay. That's about as much as I do. Um, what did you go to school for? Uh, you know, undergrad, I was studying to be a journalist. I uh, have a degree in English and sociology, and uh, ended up, though, never, I mean, it passed college. I never worked in journalism. I ended up working in public relations, and that sort of got m- my entry into uh, corporate communications. It kind of grew out of that uh, beginning part of getting into PR and then just moving up into various marketing positions. Was it PR and uh, communications for, for tech companies? Not at first. I actually had a first job working for Big Brothers Big Sisters here in mm. Oakland, which is kind of funny. But I got recruited into a high-tech um, public relations firm, and I didn't know anything about tech. So I I started reading you know, the old publications, PC Magazine and PC World, to mm-hmm. try to uh, study up on what was going on. And that's how I kind of got myself an education on that stuff. So is this the 80s, like the, the first PC era? Yeah, it was the 80s. I had taken a couple of computer classes in college, but, I mean, we're talking Fortran and Pascal. I don't think those are going to get me too far these days. But it did help me to understand the basics of programming. Well, what about, um, like you said, you you didn't have the tech background. Um, Just, you know, compared to what we're about to talk about, um, what was doing communications and PR like for for a tech company in the 80s versus what would happen in the 90s? Well, in the 80s, you know, uh, so much of the stuff that we were promoting seems sort of quaint now, you know. I mean, I worked, um, when I was at the public relations firm, I had clients like Dell Computers and uh, several graphics board companies um, in their early phases. Um, and things that today, you know, seem sort of like, oh, wow, you know, those are nice little old companies, some of which don't even exist anymore, like Borland. So um, it was it was a very different time. And, uh, and I remember one of the things that was really interesting about that time is that it was really um, – 
a lot about just the PC world. Really, you just needed to know the basics of, of a PC and maybe a little bit about uh, local area networking, and you could pretty much do the job that I did. And it's, um, I mean, is it more of a, they're, they're selling to consumers, but is it more of a, you're, you're, you're working with uh, corporate clients and, and IT departments and things like that? Yeah, quite a bit. I mean, we were we were definitely pitching stories to um uh you know, general media for companies, you know, such as Dell or or Seagate or those kinds of companies, but it was still a lot of um you know, talking to geeky publications at the time, mm. you know, um some of which ex- exist still, some that don't, but um you know, it was it was a kind of a specialty area. Uh, for people who needed to know about the guts of a computer or um, the very latest stuff coming out in terms of uh, local area networking or or Ethernet and that kind of thing, right? It's hard to it's hard to think about now, but things like PC World, uh, the, they, it's it's literally a trade publication. Whereas you know, a new iPhone comes out and it's covered you know in every possible right. <laughs> every possible publication. <laughs> but it was it right. was considered a niche, very trade, very industry sort of thing. I mean, if you really think about it, not everybody at that point had computers. We just didn't. Um, the PC really didn't get on everybody's desktop until the 90s, and then you know it was it was uh, then it was a big boom. But it was not that way in the 80s. And in, in fact, most of the companies I worked at in the 80s, we were on um, uh, you know uh, computers on our own desktop, and maybe we were linked to a, a, a printer if we were lucky. But, you know, even the idea of a networked computer was still a little bit edgy, you know, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a given. And, and I think about that now, it just seems like a completely different world. And it's hard for me when I tell my students about this, you know, it's almost like they don't quite believe me that a computer could be a standalone thing. So um, how do you uh, meet Jim Clark? Is it, do, do you get to know him when he's still at SGI? Yeah, we, um, you know, I worked at SGI starting in, I think, late 89. Um, and he and I just became friends. He was a very uh, personable guy. And I really enjoyed talking to him. He's so brilliant. Um, and often, uh, he would just come and sit with us at lunch and, you know, just chat and tell me, you know, various stories. And uh, when he decided to eventually leave SGI and start a new company, um, I helped him with his kind of his his announcement both to the in, inside of the company and to the external world. And we just found that we really enjoyed liking, you know, working together. And so he asked me if I wanted to come with him to start a company. And um, hey, it was a good it was a good thing to do, it turns out. Well, a couple questions about that. Um, you don't have to go into the, the, the politics and the whole saga. But so he's he's the founder of, of SGI. Um, but he, at the, it's not that he's pushed out, but he, he, he doesn't have the control and, and he, he wants to do something right. new where he has control. Just tell me a little bit about, uh, from your perspective, um, what was his motivation for, for leaving and, and wanting to start a new company? Sure. I mean, he was a young, a young professor when he started, uh, Silicon Graphics and he, he had taken uh, a number of the students that he had worked with. Uh, to develop a graphics chip to start SGI. This is kind of the, it ends up being the same model he uses, you know, to start Netscape. But in any case, he had started SGI um, and without really knowing anything about starting a company and uh, had not kept a lot of equity for himself, he felt. So, um, you know, after developing the company and all of that, he wanted to have a chance to go start a new company uh, and keep more of that equity for himself um, and have more control over it. And so that was what he was aiming to do. At the time when we were first, when he was first wanting to leave SGI or thinking about um, leaving SGI, he was, he knew he wanted to do something in the software space. He'd been doing hardware for so many years, but he wasn't sure what he was going to do. And that's, that was interesting when he, when he finally learned about, um, you know, the World Wide web and decided Okay, now there's something here that that could be interesting, right? Because the, there was talk of doing like software for set top boxes for for the that's right the 500 channels or like a Nintendo network or something like that. 
Right. I mean, you know, SGI had already been at sort of the forefront of thinking about broadband and delivery of video into the home. But, of course, that was going to be a while away, it, it turned out. And so those early ventures into that area were just way too premature. So he, But he was thinking about that idea of, you know, bringing this idea that you could bring um, somehow um, – knowledge or or entertainment straight into the home over some kind of a wire, if you will. So that was kind of what he had been thinking about. And so uh, one of our uh, fellow workers over at uh, SGI, Bill Foss, ended up showing him Mosaic at the time and uh, and said, you know, there's this guy, Mark Andreessen, who developed this this browser. Maybe you want to get in touch with him. And so Jim did. And I guess, as, as you say, the rest is history. Is um, is there any friction? I'm I'm, I'm going to come back to you for a second, and then we'll go into the story. Is there any friction about you coming over with him because you were at SGI about like him poaching people for his new venture? Yeah, I mean, there was definitely tension about anybody leaving SGI to go with Jim. Um, so the you know basically he could not come and say you know hey do you want to have a job, um, but. Uh, he had let it be known that I wanted that he wanted to work with me if I was open to it. So he did it in a way before he even knew what he was going to be doing. Um, and so I, I, so in some sense, he allowed people to sort of follow up with him if they were interested. And uh, you know, yes, it was a little bit of a, a tense situation because even with him not necessarily coming over and poaching people, there was definitely the sense that people were following him and leaving SGI. Mm -hmm. So it was tense. It was definitely tense. Um, what is the, when do you officially come over? What's the state of the company? Had it been founded yet or, or are they still uh, getting, getting all the Illinois kids together? When do you come over? I came over at the end of May 94. So they had just um, gotten the guys out and incorporated. Um, and I'm the first employee besides the engineers and Jim's assistant. So I'm the first, a second female, I guess, there at the company. I'm employee number 19. Um, and it was definitely interesting when I came over because it was, uh, he had uh, already secured a space on Castro Street in Mountain View uh, in Silicon Valley. And, um, but it was just a raw, several offices kind of not un, unfurnished very, very much and um, mostly just inhabited by a lot of greasy looking young guys at the <laughs> time. <laughs> well, actually, we're going to go into that in a second. But uh, were you familiar with the web at that point at all? Like, did you know what you were, what the company was going to do, what you were in for? Yes. I mean, oddly, I had also been using Mosaic a little bit when I was at Silicon Graphics before I left. Um, I don't even remember how I got introduced to it, but I, I had seen it. Um, you know, and again, at the time, there wasn't that much to do with it. I mean, I had seen, uh, you know, some of our, cl our, our clients, our customers at SGI were NASA and various um, government agencies. And so you could look up their web pages, um, you know, but there wasn't a lot to be done. It was just kind of fun to look up, you know, USGS and see what earthquakes had taken place or, you know, um, various other kind of scientific data. So that had... I had been aware of that and had done that, but it wasn't like, oh, wow, there was a whole lot for me to do on the web at that time. Um, when, when, uh, when I was coming over to work uh, at what we called Mosaic Communications at the time, which mm -hmm. became Netscape, right. I met Mark Andreessen. You know, Jim wanted me to meet him and make sure I really wanted to do this thing. And, you know, Mark was able to explain to me more his vision of what could be possible with this with this uh with this web helps me understand it a lot better what what was your, what, what was your personal impression of mark um you know he was maybe 20 i think he was still 19 maybe maybe 20 at the time and um you know he was obviously brilliant very unpolished um you know just a young guy uh he was geeky and uh talked really fast <laughs> which i think you know, it was probably one of the hardest things for me to work with, but, you know, he talked really fast, but clearly brilliant. And what what's the power dynamic? Is it like Jim says to you, uh, this is my guy, 
what whatever what whatever he wants to do that's what we're doing or is it a partnership like how does how does his how does mark's role versus jim's role at the very beginning sort of play out well jim jim really was the uh adult in the room i mean and and i could see that mark looked up to him too um jim sort certainly deferred to Mark in terms of understanding what was going on or could be possible with the internet and the World Wide Web. But what I noticed is that uh, Mark was very much in conversation with Jim. So, um, I mean, even in the, in my hiring, you know, it was Jim who said, look, Mark, this, this person can do public relations for us. We're going to get a lot of attention with her. So, you know, we need this person. And, you know, Mark at the time was like, what do we need to hire marketing? You know, Mm -hmm. anybody in marketing Mm -hmm. for at this point. And, and, um, but he deferred because that was sort of the way I feel like the dynamic worked at the time. You know, he knew that, that Jim knew his business. He knew the, he knew business and Mark knew the web. So that's kind of how it played. Tell me your impression also of, because we're going to talk a lot about culture, the, the Netscape culture and the startup culture later, but sure. your, your impression of, of the guys, the kids, like again, yeah. again, there's just a bunch of college kids that they're thrown down on Castro Street and they're, they've, they're, they're going to make a browser. Yeah, they sure are. Um, they were hilarious. I mean, they were um, certainly didn't know quite what to make of me at first, I feel like, but we all, you know, um, we all came to respect each other quite a lot in those early days because everybody was working their butts off, as you can imagine. They were hilarious. You know, they'd have their remote control cars that they're driving around the, the, uh, the offices. There were, you know, there was a futon where they'd be sleeping during the day or at, in the evenings. There was always food around because we, you know, nobody ever left the office very much. It was just a, it was a funny, uh, it was like being in a, in a frat in a way, uh, I felt. Um, in, a, in, a, it was, in a way that was positive or like you? <laughs> <laughs> well, mostly positive. I yeah. mean, it was a little smelly in there sometimes, but beyond that, I thought it was really fun. People were very, as I said, generally very respectful of one another. I mean, it was definitely a, a, a hyper environment. It wasn't like, um, uh, you know, people said what they thought. People felt free to, you know, kind of be themselves. But there was just a, a way that I felt like we were all pulling together, and people felt that, you know, that we were in this together somehow. And I, I really enjoyed getting to know the guys. And, um, you know, and I think they were curious about, you know, what is this – you know, what am I doing there? You know, what does this mean to be trying to, you know, get the the story out about this company? You know, what, you know, they didn't understand the business side that much. And so it was kind of, again, a fun, mutual learning experience, I felt like. Well, let's talk about that. What is your remit? Um, this is a, a startup software, essentially, even though it's going to become an internet company, but um, but it's, so there's not a product at the beginning, um, and you're going up against, you know, Mosaic is the dominant um, player in your market uh, when you're starting. So what is yep. what are your marching orders? What, what do you want to do? What are your goals for the company? Well, my initial goal is just to let people know what Jim's up to. When we were leaving SGI, uh, you know, I, ha- I had great relationships with a lot of press people by that time, you know, in all the major publications and, you know, and everybody was curious, like what's Jim Clark doing next? So my first order of business, Jim didn't really have many marching orders to me except to say, you know, do your thing. And, and basically I just called a lot of the people that had been following Jim's career essentially. And one of the first interviews we did was with uh, Business Week with Rob Hof, and we also had uh, just been in Fortune magazine as one of the top 25 hottest com- or coolest companies, I believe. And so there were a lot of um, uh, we got a piece in the in the sorry in the San Jose Mercury News. You know, many of the publications that had been following Jim and wanted to know what was next were dying to, to, to cover us in those early days, just to say, this is what this guy's up to. And, oh my goodness, what is this, what is this young guy that he's partnered with? Mm -hmm. So, um, 
they just made great stories. Just the guys made great stories. Well, and um, you and you consciously and Mark. you're credited with consciously doing that with with putting Mark yes. forward as well as the face of the company. Yeah, I mean, how can he not be an interesting story, Brian? I mean, the guy is like, you know, 20 years old. He's, you know, um just got this baby face, but he's, you know, obviously brilliant, you know? <laughs> yeah, but you know, of like, sorry to interrupt, but you know, today we're used to that. We're used to kids yes, creating billion are. dollar companies out of their dorm rooms and things <laughs> like that. But that's not a common story in 1993, 94. It sure isn't. I mean, I, I, you know, again, I had done a little bit of work with Michael Dell and that was a little bit of his story. There's a little bit of, you know, the Bill Gates story, but there was a way that this, kid coming out of a university um, and then, you know, bringing his pals over and starting a company with this, um, you know, proven entrepreneur, uh, you know, successful entrepreneur was a huge story. There's no question about it. And, and the thing about Mark is he's not polished. He wasn't polished at all. You know, if I could get him to wear a clean t-shirt, I was in, I was in good shape, you know? And in some ways I didn't worry about that too much. I mean, I tried to make it so that it wasn't like, you know, we looked embarrassing when, when we were having him being uh, photographed, but there was something about him just being a guy from college who clearly knew his stuff, um, just telling his story, which was, com- you know, incredibly compelling, I felt. And clearly other people agreed with me. Yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, Kismet, you get to piggyback on this amazing story that explodes into the mainstream as the web becomes the mainstream I, story. That's right. I mean, I think a lot of our early interviews, I will say, had to do with both introducing, um, you know, Mark Andreessen and educating people about what the heck the web was and what was the possibility. Again, you know, when I talk to uh, students I teach at Stanford these days, it's always an interesting thing because we take for granted today all the things that can be done on the web, you know, making purchases, doing your banking, um, you know, even communicating with each other. There's a way where none of that was really happening yet. And so, so much of what um, we had to do in those early days was create the market um, by educating people about what the possibilities were. And that meant both um, end users, consumers, but also the companies, you know, people like, um, you know, that were going to that were going to build those early uh, shopping sites. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the banks, you know, such as, you know, we had to talk to Visa and MasterCard and, and say, you know, we want Cyber you to cash. get on board here. Because, right. Yeah. So there was a lot of things that um, were laying the groundwork for what would become, you know, the web we know today. Um, this will lead me into talking about, like, more of the culture stuff and especially like the speed what you know would they would call netscape time or, or whatever but um how much of a problem in the earliest days was the whole issue around the university of illinois and mosaic and um you know you call yourself mosaic communications company like how much of that was a problem that you had to manage early on that that they were maybe not happy with what you guys were doing well i i think we didn't realize in the first couple months that it could be as problematic as it would become. But it was obviously um, pretty quickly obvious that they were not happy with us. Um, that you know became clear uh, in about, I would say, uh, September, October. September, I believe, because we started getting pressure from them um, to change the name. They partnered with uh, a rival group, right, Spyglass. Spyglass. Yeah. Um, and so uh, Spyglass was the sanctioned organization, and we were considered the enemy, which was kind of odd since we had all their students. And, uh, you know, Jim had thought that uh, University of Illinois would be like Stanford was when he started SGI, happy that he'd gone off and started a company. But that wasn't the case in this in this case. So, um yeah, I guess I would say it, it. It you know it came to a head at the end of September when we had to really hustle to change our name. So I, I'm gonna really try hard to ask this in a way that's not leading the witness or <laughs> whatever. But <laughs> no so the, the whole concept of 
Netscape time, internet time, whatever the various phrases from the time period came to be. Um, the idea that the guys have to get a product to market in various, some of the people, some of the guys have told me themselves, the, the motivation is either, well, we, we want to beat Mosaic and we want to we want to get out there uh, and 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 overturn the 800 pound gorilla of the market as fast as possible. Um, part yeah. of it is, well, we feel like there's this market that no one has woken up to yet and we want to get out there as fast as possible. Um, Jim Clark wants to um, create this company and, and get it big and maybe IPO as fast as possible. And we, we need to do anything we can before Bill Gates notices us. So again, without trying to lead you in any direction, the idea of this startup <laughs> culture, this let's have a, let's now, now, now let's release, release. Where, where do you, in your recollection, where did that motivation come from? Uh, exactly what you've probably heard from the guys, it sounds like. Um, Jim was very aware of Microsoft and that Microsoft would try to kill any software company that built a market. We'd seen that over and over through the years already. Um, and so he was very aware of that. More, and he was more concerned about that than I would say about any other browser mm. Um, coming from the side, like we weren't particularly concerned about Spyglass. We weren't, you know, particularly concerned with the free browser. We were concerned, or he was concerned, and got us all concerned that Microsoft would understand what we were doing and jump on it. Uh, in fact, I believe by I want to say maybe August, September, somebody from Microsoft actually came out and met with Jim. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't tell him too much, and he was very, you know, concerned about uh, what they were really after. But that happened, and uh, so, you know, he legitimately felt um, like, you know, we've he's seen this before that that we needed to, to to be out to market quickly. We needed to be established quickly so that it would be hard to overturn us. And there's no so that was the, that was the there's no thought of playing ball with Microsoft, which. Again, 20 years on, sounds like a reasonable question, but if I say this in 1994, 1995, maybe sounds like a dumb question. <laughs> well, again, you know, it, it's uh, at what point do you want to play ball? Maybe you uh, want to play ball if you're at a certain size where mm -hmm, you could mm -hmm. um, command a certain amount of money perhaps. But at this point, we're just starting out. And, a lot, you know, and what we had seen in, again, in, in the Valley over and over were small startups who had their, you know, kind of their software out there. And Microsoft said, oh, that's interesting. Let's build that into our operating system. And many companies were killed before they were even, you know, uh, allowed to, to bloom. So we didn't want that to happen. That's what we were trying to guard against is we wanted to be out there. We wanted to be a name. We wanted to be uh, have market share, and you know, and and Jim was also very interested in building a company that would be around. He really didn't. He was not. Uh, he was not building this to flip. Uh, so you and I were on this uh, documentary where we tell the story of of launching the browser and the ding 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 ding. <laughs> Um, right. <laughs> I, I, so let me ask you to to, rec to recall launching the product from a different perspective. You know, you've worked with other tech companies before. Um, from your perspective, uh, when the browser launches and it gets pick up and it takes off, like, had you seen anything like that before? Uh, there's no way I'd ever seen anything like that before, Brian. I'm not sure anybody had really ever seen anything quite like it. Um, I mean, I I don't even think the guys could have imagined uh, the pickup. I, none of us could. It was it was a crazy thing. It was like um, we were already getting so much attention. People were already watching every move we made. It was, but still, when we put the beta out, and you know, thousands and thousands of people are downloading it overnight, you know, without us even announcing that we'd put it out. It was a crazy, crazy thing. And, uh, you know, we got to millions of users within, I don't know, a few months of, of its release. And it doing was, nothing was, but just like opening the, the barn doors and saying, come get it. That's right. 
That's right. I mean, the demand was just so crazy by that point. Uh, we'd gotten enough attention. People were very curious. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. And so, you know, uh, folks that I felt like, you know, probably hadn't even had a PC that long all of a sudden were, you know, wanting to be on the web. It was it was a crazy, crazy time. Um, acknowledging that this is a, a little bit outside y your remit, um, the the initial strategy for the company, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking before the IPO, like literally with the browser, like yeah. it, it was the razor, razor blade strategy where we're going to kind of sort of give the browser away for free and make our money on the servers? Yes, that's exactly right. The idea was that it was not really about the browser. The browser, getting the browser into people's hands was going to make folks on the back end want to build, uh, a, you know, put up a, a shop. Uh, distribute something, uh, you know, get the banks interested in, in offering services, all of those things. So really that's where the money was, get people to build back-end systems. Uh, you know, so we were making not just the basic server, but we started right away making uh, application servers and various other kinds of servers, which, to, you know, these days um, – I don't even know what they what they call them anymore, but that's that's that was sort of the idea was get the back end stuff started, uh, you know. But by but um, basically, if you got if you've got people ready to 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 shop, then you're hey, building a shop doesn't seem crazy. Where if you're building a shop and nobody's gonna buy anything from you, then that doesn't really work, does it? So that was kind of the strategy. Well, what is your remit um, when when the browser does come out and it, it has this amazing uptake um, from a PR, from a comms perspective, uh, does it become a thing where you have to sort of manage? You guys become like the first of this generation of like golden companies. Like, it, That's are, right. are you trying to tamp down expectations or are you just like the, the more bring it, bring it, bring it more, more, more? Well, I, more, more, more was really the key. I, I mean, I don't think we really weren't trying to, um, I guess I, I would say we weren't trying to hype the company to a degree where uh, we couldn't fulfill. You know, that, that was not mm -hmm. the case. But in terms of like uh, pushing the name out there, really uh, continuing to build demand, that we were not trying to tamp down. Um you know, it was different once we got, we decided to, to do the IPO. Right, I was going to ask that. Because then it, it gets a little bit trickier. But, but at the beginning part, it was really like all, you know, just push it out there, Roseanne. That was kind of the message. Just like get out there anywhere around the world, do as much as we could to get the name out. And that's what we did. Well, be, uh, the reason I'm curious about that is because on the one hand, you want to... You want to get the product out there and you want to establish your foothold in the marketplace before Microsoft notices. But then at the same time, you want to, you want to play with the hype. You want to roll with the hype, not, not hype, but the, the attention. Yes. Yeah. So yes. it, that's intention a little bit. Oh yeah, it is intention. And um, I think the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in the, uh, of the mind that, um, Attention isn't isn't a bad thing, uh, and and Jim Clark feels much the same way. When you're building a market, you got to get out there. There's no question about it. And so being too shy about telling your story isn't going to do you much good. So our feeling was just get out there. You know, get out there, and um, as long as we're not, uh, like I said, over hyping ourselves to a place where we can't deliver what we're saying. Um, so much of what we were trying to do was just about uh, still really in those first, I would say first couple of years was just about education in many ways. So that's, that's kind of what we focused on. So, uh, why IPO so early? <laughs> well, that was a long discussion. And as you can imagine, uh, it was not without opinions on both sides, mm -hmm. but the idea was again, if we were going to keep growing uh, and, well, grow fast enough, let's put it that way, grow fast enough so that Microsoft could not pick us off, we needed the resources to be able to do that. And clearly the demand was there for, our, you know, for a piece of the action. So, you know, what was on the, the, the con side of the argument, if you will, was that as soon as we 
went public or said we were going to go public, suddenly we had to be a lot more careful. We had not been careful in terms of, you know, um, uh, what people said publicly or, you know, um, you know, who said what to whom, you know, our, our guys were in some ways allowed to be colorful till then. And then all of a sudden we would have to be much more controlled in the message. And, um, although, you know, again, we were controlled more than probably people realize, but still we, we would have to dial it up because we would be in the public eye in a way that, could get us in trouble if we didn't um, sort of follow the rules of the game. So that was the con side, but the upside would be that we would have the resources to really hire a ton of people and just get this thing really moving. Um, again, as a PR comms person, the, the actual IPO itself, uh, you know, again, in, in 95, it's unusual for a technology story an IPO, forget a technology story, an IPO to make the, the evening news. So that's right. in your job, what was that sort of supernova <laughs> like? Well, you know, I, I just want to say that it was, um, it was a supernova for sure. Um, but it wasn't like uh, we'd already had a bit of, you know, minor supernovas. Maybe we just had novas. Maybe that's what we should say. Um, we had already been in such, so much um, business press and public eye, even in that first year, that now it was going to just be ratcheted up. So one of the things that I knew right away was we were going to be having crazy amounts of calls come in, which we did. So we set up a, a bank of people whose only job it was was to answer the phone and be polite to people as they were calling in. And that meant anybody who was calling in. Because, I mean, imagine, if you will, people hear about this, this company that's red hot right now going public. Everybody thought they owned a piece of it because they had downloaded a browser and they all wanted – stock. Mm. And of, of course, we weren't, sell, we weren't selling the stock and it wasn't even public yet, but the phones were ringing off the hook with wanting people wanting you know, to know about what was going on and how to get involved. So we just needed to give our front desk people relief. So I set up a bank of people who worked in my public relations office to just answer the phones, <laughs> literally just <laughs> answer the phones and be kind to people so that we wouldn't um, be off-putting during that time. And then there were, you know, the legitimate calls coming in from, you know, various uh, pub, uh, public um, entities, you know, uh, press people, analysts, all kinds of stuff that we had to handle differently. But but in terms of just the phone ringing, that was probably the biggest problem we had. I feel like there's uh, IPO and right after there's maybe a year, 18 months or whatever. Like you guys are, are the golden company, like the, the hottest company in the world. Yeah. Um, I had uh, Rob Reed on recently. I don't know if you remember him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I sure do. He wrote one of the first exactly. books on that time frame. So he, he had a little commentary that he thought that maybe in this period um, it sort of went to Netscape's head <laughs> generally, um, all of this attention. I, I'm curious what, what you think about like that, yeah. that sort of afterglow, that, that golden period as we're talking about. Well, I mean, I certainly have heard the narrative that we were an arrogant company. Um, That's and the that word. Was, those are the words he used. Yes. Yeah, everybody said it at the time, and there was no question that that was the impression. I just want to tell you from the inside what it was like. Certainly, um, I won't say that there wasn't a sort of uh, like, "Wow, this is amazing!" Sense, you know, that does get get to you, get to you, if you will. You know, if enough people tell you you're amazing, you start mm -hmm. to think, "Hey, I'm amazing." But at the same time, I believe, and I, from what I saw. A lot of what people read as arrogance was simply people going too crazy to answer the phone or to answer every email and having so much demand for crazy stuff that we couldn't possibly um, – you know, we were still a small company, I guess is what I want to say. So, like, we had this image like we were huge, and we weren't huge. We mm -hmm. were still a, a relatively small company growing fast. Um, and so I think a lot of what people read as arrogance was just like, we can't meet this demand. We can't possibly talk to everybody that wants to talk to us. We can't meet with every person that wants to meet with us. And um, I, I saw how that got misread. Um, so that's what I think a big part of it was. 
was people feeling like we were arrogant because we couldn't attend to them personally. And we're going to talk about this again some more before we close, but uh, how much of it now in retrospect is it that there's no template for you to follow? Like now if you're a, a red hot startup, if you're Snapchat in, in year one or whatever, you know, like there are templates to follow. There are, there are examples yes. that you can look at. How much do you think was you, you guys were kind of the first? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with us being the first. I Nobody could have imagined, honestly. I I think in retrospect, it is kind of a funny thing to, to look at because you see all these other examples. You know, but one of the funny parts is, like, I have consulted. Like, when Google was going public, I consulted with them about it because they were worried mm -hmm. about the same thing happening to them. So, you know, there's so much of what... Um, you know, we have passed down knowledge or, you know, knowledge has accumulated since then. But at the time, nobody really could predict the kind of craziness that would erupt on the company, um, you know, once we went public. And, and really, people assumed because of the money that was coming into us, because of the attention we got, that we were, um, a, that we ourselves were a gorilla. And we weren't. We were, at the time of the IPO, about... Mm, 300 people maybe that's not a lot of people to be handling you know the kind of attention we were that was coming into us at the time so when you think about that Brian it's like yes we would have done things differently we did we did the best we could and we certainly anticipated sort of what could happen but not to the degree uh, not to the amount of people who were clamoring to meet with us clamoring to you know um, to uh, do business with us, people who wanted to partner with us, you name it. So it was a lot. So you mentioned, you know, um, being a company of 300 people. Uh, unfortunately, we have to, the worm has to turn a little bit here. Um, when all of a sudden Microsoft is throwing a thousand people on their Internet Explorer right. team and... Um, you you guys were always like like you said Jim especially you knew Microsoft was coming. Um, I'm curious more from the cultural and and you can even speak to this yourself or what you saw other people inside the company when when the going started to get tough and you've got Microsoft pointing all their guns at you guys. Um, what did that feel like? <laughs> did you feel like that you had a way out or did it feel like? sort of like the jaws are closing around you? Uh, yikes. I mean, it's a little bit of both. There's a sort of a sense of, I guess there's always the sense that I have when I look back on that of we were all always running so fast that this was just another piece of the, okay, they're catching up. You know what I mean? There's a sense of, run faster now you know? mm, so mm. Um, the tension just gets ratcheted up it's not like we weren't feeling that pressure already that was sort of the again jim's mantra from the beginning was we've got to go fast but this is now clear that we've got to go faster and i think um that's a it, it it affected everybody. I mean, it was already in our blood that you didn't do, you know, the part of the mantra was you don't do things 100%. You do them 80% and get them out there. Um, and that was kind of the idea was you can't wait for everything to be perfect all the time. Perfect was not going to be the name of the game. The, per the perfect would come later. You know, once you get things out there, you can perfect the product. Once you, once you, um, sort of throw, uh, you know, the beta out, you can, you can get rid of the bugs, that kind of stuff, because there just wasn't time. There wasn't time to be perfect. Right. So, yeah, the, the pressure was on. Uh, but it was, I just want to say, I feel like it was always on. It just ratcheted up or another it, notch. It just changed the, the flavor or the degree of the pressure, I yeah. guess. Well, right. It's like now it's not like, oh, we're trying to be, you know, kind of like run as fast as you can and maybe – Microsoft will start out of the gate. Well, now Microsoft is out of the gate. <laughs> They're out of the gate in a big way because the, the, they've got the bears behind you, so you're running you. faster for a reason. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like all of a sudden you're like, thank God we got a head start, right? Yeah, so, yeah. but we did have a head start. We had at that point, um, you know, again, tens of millions of people who are already our customers or users at that time. So, and we had the 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 aura of being the you know the company. So. 
uh, that is the advantage we have, but clearly their advantage is they're Microsoft, and they're in control of the software that powers everybody's computer. Um, well, again, you can only speak for yourself from, from your position, but I'm curious your thoughts about those two or three years pivoting as Microsoft is coming and, and, and suddenly the browser is, is can't make you money anymore. And so go to enterprise, go to, uh, you know, e even eventually you turn Netscape.com into a portal and, and, and get advertising money and things like that. Was there, <laughs> again, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm going to lead you into something, but that's all right. That's all right. was it, was it just throwing things against the wall or was there some coherent strategy or were you just trying to figure out whatever you could do that, that they could buy another six months or another quarter or something? Well, it was never just buy another six months or a quarter. I was in most of those discussions mm. because I was generally in the, you know, in the executive team discussions. So I kind of watched the evolution. It was really trying to gauge where, where the market was going or help, you know, kind of guide the market. So at first, you know, it was about, um, you know, just getting servers out there, right? Getting the people to build a back end <laughs> so that people had something to access. Then it became clear that some uh, companies wanted to build internal networks, right? So this became this whole idea of the intranet. Right, right. And we started selling, you know, more, we bought a company called Calabra and started doing more groupware kinds of applications and that kind of software. Well, then, you know, it's like, well, then you get these bigger customers who really want like end to end publishing money, transfer ability, you know, solutions. And so we start building out these bigger systems, you know, that are really m much more complex that can uh, do all kinds of, you know, a lot more work than just, oh, here's a web page. So, you know, it's it's kind of evolving as we see what our customers are demanding and what is where the, where this is all heading. You know, it's like trying to um, – you're steering the, the – you're steering this race car – as the freeway is being built, if you will. Right. Again, and it's so, a situation know, there's where be... there's no template because the mar you're, you're not That's only right. the first ones, it, the market is brand new. So you don't even know what the market right. is at that point. That's right. I mean, you know, again, I, I try to explain to people like it's it's a fun, funny thing because you don't, you know, again, kind of backing up a little bit, you know, our first um, – uh, you know, times when back in '94, when we're showing people what can be done on a web page, you know, we're meeting with people like Jan Winter of Rolling Stone. Well, the mock-up for those pages, what, you know, envisioned envisioned a page of uh, text with some photos, and then the next page is an ad. You know, a full page ad. The next page is, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, like it's it's kind of not even imagining what would become what was what's a web page really going to look like with advertising integrated. What's um, what's a storefront really going to look like with, you know, uh, p uh, payment capabilities integrated? So you have to, in a way, we're, we're trying to educate people on that, and we're also trying to watch what people are doing and respond to their to what they're doing. And, and so it's, 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 it isn't like we're just throwing things against the wall. We're, we're trying to see what people want and both lead and follow at the same time, if you know what I'm saying. So um, – it, it was never like, oh, you know, let's try this and see if it works. It's more like, okay, I think this is what, what's going on here. This is what these guys want to do, so let's build that out and see what happens. And, um, you know, and that's kind of what's going on at that time. And then you've got, you know, all the companies that are now developing based off of our being there, right? So you've got eBay who's come on the scene. You've got Amazon who's come on the scene. Or Yahoo. Yahoo. Right. Yeah. Right, I mean Yahoo started, like I said, in a cubicle over from me. I was going to say you guys, you guys helped them run. get started. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. I mean, and we helped a lot of companies get started. Excite, which you know no longer exists, many companies that no longer exist. But these things were all happening, you know, in these early years, ninety five, ninety six, and that's changing the landscape too, right? So each each of these these companies is contributing to building out that roadway that we are then going to have to, you know, keep steering on. So it's a very dynamic time in a way that I don't, I, you know, yes, things are moving very quickly today, but I don't think we've got a precedent for 
the way things were moving at that time. You know, that it was just crazy. Were you in the meetings, the strategy meetings about uh, deciding to open source the browser code? Oh, yes. That was another big one where we very seriously had to look at the pros and cons, right? It was a huge part of our revenue stream right at the time. It was about 80% of our business or, or money coming in was from the browser. So, uh, you know, if we were going to do this thing and make the browser completely free, then that meant we had to be pretty confident that we could somehow cover that revenue. Uh, and um, and that, that in the long run was going to be uh, – you know, a winning, a winning strategy for us. It was a dangerous thing to do, but it was also the, in a sense, an inevitable thing to do, given that Internet Explorer at that point was bundled with the operating system on every PC you bought. So um, it had to be done, but it was a painful thing to do, and it was uh, not taken lightly, is what I would say. So um, I led the team that ultimately did the release of that software um, for free, and you know, and and really um, made that public, if you will. But it was a it was a it was a tough one. What about the the meetings to sell to AOL? That was not one I was so privy to in the early days. Those things were always going on, um, you know, of companies coming and wanting to, to buy our company or do various partnerships. So that wasn't something that I necessarily was in on in the early days. When I was brought in, you know, it was pretty clear that we were having a tough time going it on our own. So this is now, you know, end of 98, mm -hmm. um, and – uh, things are, you know, things are getting rough. Things are getting rough out there. Um, Microsoft is, has done deals uh, that are precluding us being able to do deals in certain ways. And, um, you know, we'd already gone out to the Justice Department. That was underway. But, we, you know, the Justice Department wasn't going to save us, if you, if you know what I'm saying. That was just a, um, you know, there definitely was a claim that there was a monopoly going on here. But, at but you guys were time, definitely cognizant of that. Like, that's not the white horse that's going to ride in. Probably not, right? It's going to take a long time, even if the Justice Department, as they did, you know, ultimately find Microsoft a monopoly. They didn't, you know, they, there was only so much they were going to do. And so that wasn't going to necessarily be the white horse. We needed to really think about what is our future. So um, it, it sort of came down to would it make sense for AOL to buy us given that they weren't interested in, in all of the enterprise software that we had done? And so as you, as you probably remember, uh, what, what ended up happening was there was a, a funky deal that was created where AOL essentially bought us and Sun Microsystems, which no longer <laughs> exists on its own either, um, bought our uh, enterprise software and all of this stuff on that side of the business to, to sell with their server systems. So, that was ultimately what we went with. Um, the uh, you leave around then, right? I I left um, as soon as the this deal closed. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to work for a big company, and uh, I ended up cons you know if you want to put it in quotation marks because it was really not that much of a consulting. But I consulted back to AOL for about nine months afterward, um, trying to help them keep other Netscape employees from jumping ship, essentially. Uh, mostly unsuccessfully, I would say, I would point out. Well, you know, I couldn't exactly tell people to stay when I didn't want to stay. Yeah. I mean, you know, the people who are attracted to a startup like that are not the people who are going to want to work for AOL, which was a, a very bureaucratic, slow-moving company. I mean, that was part of their problem. They saw the world as a controlled system, you know, they had for a long time. And so just, you know, even when we were doing the announcement of their purchase of us, the, having to work with their bureaucratic, you know, with their hierarchy, that was not something I was used to. It certainly wasn't something that any Netscaper was used to. We just made decisions and we went with them. You know, we were a very scrappy gang. And so 
it, this was not a culture that was going to fit well with ours. And so I didn't blame people for wanting to jump ship. Okay, unfair question. Is there something, some decision, some strategy that you can think of with 20 years of hindsight that would have allowed Netscape to survive independently into the 21st century? No, not really. I mean, I guess doing something that we didn't, you know, like some other form of business that we hadn't come up with, you know, um, I don't know what that would have been. Maybe acquiring Amazon. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not certain, you know, um, acquiring eBay. I mean, I guess you could get nutty about it, right? You could yeah. say, sort of say, maybe we should have partnered with somebody else um, who had a different kind of business built off of the web. But um, those are, you know, those are things that are hard to sort of imagine at the time. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, is this a bad outcome, what we had? Yeah, in a way, it, it was sad, certainly, to have to sell the AOL and to see our independence gone but i'm not sure if i see a way where um you know without some kind of combination of us with another company that we could have survived um we'll end with uh talking about what you're up to today but you you do teach still today and um research and things like that um but again with 20 years of hindsight when you yes. look at when you look at the startup culture of Silicon Valley that Netscape sort of set the template for, um, what do you see? Like, do you see, oh, the, why are they copying our blueprint? We 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 did it this way because we had to, or we didn't know any better. Or actually, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. What do you see when you see startups today? When you consult with startups and things like that? Well, I I'm you know I mostly teach engineers, young engineers, and, uh, and I teach them leadership and management and branding and all kinds of things like that. So I'm, I'm teaching specifically engineers mm -hmm. about business. And, uh, and I guess in doing that, one of the things I have come to really harp on a lot, and maybe it's good and maybe it's bad, is that I want them not to, not to create the kinds of, um, companies in a way that that we spawned uh back in the 90s which were companies unfortunately that saw our model and thought hey let's just build something really fast and flip it and i think that is an unfortunate thing that i still see in the valley today is people trying to get rich quick um, not really caring about the culture that they set up not building things to last not um thinking about sort of their lasting legacies um and also, you know, something that really bothers me quite a bit is not thinking about what it is that we are unleashing on the world as we put these things out there. I mean, I think Netscape certainly was guilty of that, too. In, in, but I, I feel like it's, it's the problem with anything where, where the emphasis on, is on building it versus on thinking about what is its impact? Why are we building this? What is this really for, and what's it going to contribute? And I, and that's, I guess, the things that worry me the most as I watch more and more uh, people starting companies that I feel like are, are, I'm not sure if they're all for the public good, and I'm not even sure that people think about whether they they should be building this thing or not. If that makes any sense, Brian. Well, is it is kind of it, it is kind of what I'm asking, which is. To what degree the young engineers that you're teaching, are they chasing that dream, that sort of pot of gold that Netscape proved was there versus those kids from Illinois that came out to Silicon Valley were just, hey, this is a cool thing we're going to do. We don't know any better. Like, is it more yeah. like the hipsters making the scene now, you feel like? Well, I think it's always a mix. You know, we've got a lot of young people, and I, w I will say, who are very concerned with social responsibility and those kinds of things in a way that I'm not sure I certainly was at that age. But um, so that's a that's a good thing. But I do think there's quite a few folks who still feel like, hey, look, we can come up with this crazy app and sell it for millions, or we can come up with this thing and, you know, just flip it. That, I think, is a concerning 
way to think. Um, I mean, not like, oh gosh, you shouldn't make money, but it more that I just feel like as we look around um, at the, at the kind of crazy world we've created, there are so many technologies that I feel like have not necessarily enriched us. And I would like us to take a little bit more time and maybe I can say this now, you know, 20 years later Mm -hmm. to just think about the impact of what we're creating and it doesn't mean we don't create it. It just means let's think about it. It's a little like the, you know, all of these applications of artificial intelligence. Just think about it. You know, again, before we rush off and do, wouldn't it be nice to take a breath or two and sort of say, what are the social impacts going to be? What are the potential downsides? And how do we mitigate against those? So I, I don't know. That's the, that's the biggest concern I have as we go forward is, is that we may have unleashed this idea that anybody can get rich in four years and that that's the, that that's the gold standard. Well, Roseanne, I think that's a, a good place to leave it. Um, I, I, I'm i so fascinated. I, I really wanted to speak to you from day one <laughs> of doing this podcast. <laughs> I'm so thankful that you, uh, I finally got a hold of you and, and you agreed to come on and, and, and shared this story. Like, such a great perspective. Um, your, your, your uh, you know, management versus the, the engineers that I've spoken to also. Uh, like, thank you so much for sharing the Netscape story and, and basically 20 years of, of what uh, technology is now. Thank you so much, Brian. I enjoyed it very much. If you like what you've heard on this episode, please support us by subscribing to the podcast so you can get great news stories and conversations every two weeks. And please buy the book that was based on this podcast. How the Internet Happened from Netscape to the iPhone by me, Brian McCullough. Order it now wherever books are sold. How the Internet Happened.